Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 182 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Fred Natus, author of the nonfiction book The Man from Mars, Ray Palmer's Amazing Pulp Journey. Palmer was a key figure in early science fiction fandom, and his tireless promotion of the genre eventually landed him his dream job as the editor of the pulp science fiction magazine Amazing Stories. But Palmer earned the ire of many fans when he began suggesting that some of the stories he published might actually be true. These were the so-called Schaefer mystery stories, about a subterranean race of evil aliens. Palmer's wild claims sold a lot of magazines, but also caused science fiction fans to be associated with UFO conspiracy theorists, leading some fans to label Palmer the man who killed science fiction. And now, here's our interview with Fred Natus. All right, so we're here with Fred Natus. Welcome to the show. Hi, great to be here. Okay, so your book is about Ray Palmer, who is the editor of the pulp science fiction magazine Amazing Stories. But before he became an editor, Palmer was actually a major figure in early science fiction fandom. So tell us about that. Well, he uh, he was one of the, the first generation uh, who uh, fell under uh, Hugo Gernsbach's spell. Uh, Gernsbach had been publishing a lot of science fiction in his uh, Science and Invention magazine and his other magazines, Electrical Experimenter. But in 1926, he decided it was really time to launch an all-science fiction magazine, Amazing Stories. And he thought that it was a new genre and it needed a new name, so he called it Scientifiction, a name that actually people have kind of brought back as a kind of tribute lately. But uh, he eventually renamed it Science Fiction, and I think in the late 20s. And uh, so Palmer uh, was just thrilled by uh, the magazine. Um, the first cover it shows the, the uh, a scene from a Jules Verne novel where these people are crashed somehow on a comet off the planet of uh, of uh, Saturn, and uh, they look almost like monkeys skating around. But it was just this this hallucinogenic scene, and um, Palmer is a kind of a young outcast. He was a um, he had been injured as a child. Uh, he had been struck by a truck and uh, shattered his vertebrae. And so he was like a really short, hunchback guy. And he, you know, he, he described himself as the man from Mars as a way to kind of explain his looks and to kind of get people to get used to him. So anyway, so science fiction just became a tremendous um, outlet for him. And uh, he became one of the prime movers in, in the fan scene, which really there was, never had been a fan scene before the science fiction uh, fan scene that Gernsbach helped instigate. Right. And so you talk about Gernsback that at the time he was really pushing this idea of science fiction as almost like its own religion. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, he, he, he saw it also as a very practical terms of shaping the future or, or almost a visionary experience of imagining, you know, the, the future and new technologies and what they could do. But uh, also, I mean, he really felt like we had to spread this faith. You know, he was also trying to nurture his readership and, uh, and, and make the genre stick. Uh, but he, he literally described it as evangelizing uh, and, and spreading the gospel. And um, there's also, I think, it was very sort of high seriousness to it at the time, even though it was a pulp magazine that didn't have the lurid covers. And Gernsberg made it the point that he uh, it avoided sex stories. You know, he th it was a cl kind of clean, wholesome outlet for, he's thinking boys mainly. And... Um, and I mean, so this whole uh, new subculture evolves around it with the, the first world conventions starting, local science fiction clubs, uh, book lending libraries. Um, and, you know, they even, they got really goofy and started inventing their own religions. Uh, uh, like the, one of them was, they're worshiping a god named Roscoe, a giant beaver in outer space somewhere. So I don't you know, it was, it was very silly kind of outlet for adolescents at the time, but also they had this high seriousness they saw themselves as an avant-garde, you know, um, visionaries, really. Yeah, and, and I saw Grunsback, he had a column say, called What Have I Done to Spread Science Fiction? And he would invite readers to write letters saying what they had done to spread the gospel. Right, yeah. And um, Palmer won this contest. Uh, first, his partner did because uh, Walter Dennis and him had started the first fanzine again. Uh, a major milestone of sorts. I mean, uh, maybe not quite the Magna Carta, but... Uh, there really hadn't been fanzines before this, and they put something together called The Comet. Uh, and it was, again, it started out as a very serious effort to uh, educate other young readers who wanted to be science fiction writers. 
So that is often just covering scientific topics, uh, you know, articles on uh, psychoanalysis or, you know, the atmosphere, that kind of thing. Uh, Palmer won the contest for um, creating a lending library where he was determined to ship books around to um, to other science fiction kids, if you will. And um, he, he, he promised that he would use all his, his prize money towards this effort. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and sort of two anecdotes stick out in my mind about what a big fan Palmer was. And one is that at one point, people said that Palmer was the number one fan in science fiction and Forrest Ackerman was the number two fan. And then Palmer was also the number three and the number four fan. I yeah, that was funny. And then also the other one was at one point, uh, Hugo Gernsback was voted at a convention, the father of science fiction, and Palmer was voted the son of science fiction. Yeah. And th this was kind of when he, he had been a controversial figure for a while. And this was kind of a tribute later in about 1950, I think it was, at a world convention in Chicago when they, uh, Palmer always had his fans in Chicago because he, he had been based there with amazing stories. And they gave him this plaque saying he was the son of science fiction. <laughs> so. Well, well, yeah. So tell us about Amazing Stories. How did he end up becoming the editor there? Well, uh, uh, Gernsback, you know, started Amazing Stories in 1926. And I think in about 1929, uh, he lost control of them. He had been sued for not paying his debts to a lot of printers. And, and uh, so he lost rights to the magazines. And he, he went on quickly, I think, to, within months to start Wonder Stories. But Amazing Stories lived on with new owners. And um, the same editor, um, Farnsworth, an, an old, an old um, Gernsbach had picked him. He was a PhD. He was a science uh, instructor. He had hundreds of patents. He's a very serious older gentleman. Uh, some people called him old fuzzball. He took months to respond to people's manuscripts or let them sit for years. In any case, uh, the magazine kept changing hands in, until it was picked up by Ziff Davis in Chicago. They were more like uh, high-end hobby magazines. They had a uh, radio news and uh, well they got that from Gernsback but they had um, popular photography popular aviation flying magazines uh, and they really didn't know what to do with these pulps they had and um, the owners talked to one of uh, Palmer's older friends Palmer had you know was a very good networker he's in a group called the uh, Milwaukee Fictioneers a, a writers club up in Milwaukee of uh, pulp writers and this older guy you know said you know I got just the person for you and, and, and recommended Palmer uh, he was about 28, I think, at the time, and they interviewed him, and the next day he just moved from Milwaukee to Chicago and immediately got to work trying to save Amazing Stories, which had kind of fallen to decline at that point. Right, and you say that they weren't really planning to hire him, but he impressed them so much that they hired him on the spot, and he had this really forceful, charismatic personality. Yeah, I think there was, there was something about him. He was a very, um, I get the sense, uh, he, he had a very breathy kind of voice, and that may, may have been due to his injuries, but he also just had this real, uh, I don't know what the word is, sweet and high voltage character that comes through in his writing and, and, and the way people responded to him. I remember uh, Robert Block, the horror writer, when he first met him as when Palmer was about 20 and Block was about 16 at the Milwaukee Fictionaries, he, you know, he was going to his first meeting and he was going to be escorted to Palmer's house. And he says, you know, it's sort of uh, not politically correct, but he said this dwarfish figure, you know, approached me. And then he said, but immediately we began talking and I forgot about his physical, you know, disabilities and just, he, he was Ray, you know, so his personality just shone through. I mean, he managed to court a, a lovely young woman not too long, you know, after that. I mean, so he, he didn't, he didn't really let his disabilities um, slow him down at all. Right. And so, yeah. And so you mentioned that Amazing Stories was kind of struggling. So how did uh, Palmer succeed in turning that around? Uh, he did. He, he, um, and his, his approach, which the the uh, editor uh, the publishers encouraged him was to to turn it more towards I guess it had been doing a lot of reprints of, of things like H. G. Wells and Jules Verne and uh, a little bit of Edgar Rice Burroughs and he he loved Edgar Rice Burroughs and he wanted to do that kind of story the, the science romances or the planetary you know uh, romance stories you know ray guns and warp drives and uh, vortexes <laughs> uh, so it was, he was pitching it towards the younger readers the teenage boys maybe some girls. Um, and so it became kind of a juvenile level magazine, but very energetic. He threw out the whole stock of stories just about supposedly that Farnsworth had at the time. And he wrote a lot himself. He made up all sorts of um, pen names to use. Um, and he actually got a stable of writers I th that I think he even put on a monthly salaries. So they're just kind of there to write for him. I mean, they're doing other stuff as well. Uh, and I think it was a 
same approach a lot of pulp magazines had used, like detective magazines. Sometimes they'd have the cover art first, and then they try to concoct the story to fit it. Uh, but also, I think you know he really revitalized it in terms of his editor's column. Uh, he because uh, Farnsworth had been the, a very you know wonderful, sweet old guy, but he, he was kind of stodgy. His letters pages would have the letters would have um, titles like "An Irish Boy Writes the Most Friendly Letter" or <laughs> "A Very Good and Amusing Letter from a Young Correspondent." We presume, you know, so it was this kind of arch Victorian way about him, and and. Palmer was the complete opposite. He was kind of like this, I'm just a regular guy and uh, uh, very chummy. He wanted to be just one of the guys in the clubhouse. And he, so I think he really in- invented that, that notion of the editor's page in comic books later, like Stan Lee, of just really opening up to the reader, giving them a behind-the-scenes look and just saying silly things and, and being on the same wavelength as, as the young readers. You know, in the early days, he, he, he was pushing towards these planetary romance, fun, high-action stories. And it worked. The, the, the circulation picked up. Right. I mean, one anecdote that sticks in my mind is he told one writer, cross out everything in the story that you consider to be good writing and I'll buy it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the other the other legend about him is that he would say, whenever this story um, slows down, just throw another corpse through the skylight. <laughs> and uh, or give me bang bang was another supposed expression he'd, he'd put. And uh, the guy who he originally said about, you know, mark out all, all your favorite phrases to said what Palmer really meant was work that twist, brother, you know. So it wasn't like he really wanted a lot of corpses through the skylights, but he wanted something unexpected to happen. Right. And so at that time, the most respected science fiction pulp magazine was Astounding, edited by John W. Campbell. And so Palmer's Amazing Stories was kind of a uh, the less prestigious competitor for that. Oh, yeah. I, I, say, I think that's a fair assumption. For example, um, Isaac Asimov... Uh, kind of pretended that he never published an amazing stories although <laughs> as a 16 year old he started writing letters to palmer and i think when he was about 18 he had his first story or two printed in amazing stories but he kind of wanted to pretend that his first stories were published in astounding which is where he really found his home later but yeah i, I think uh campbell had started in, in as, as a very good writer of the kind of space operas that uh gernsbach and and palmer loved uh, but he began to think that he you needed know, slightly more sophisticated, you know, storytelling techniques and literary techniques in the stories. So Palmer was always like, you know, I, 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 I used to love these intellectual puzzles, but you know, I, I, I liked a, a story that I can, you know, that the kids will enjoy. So he, he saw himself as doing something different than, than Campbell. And yeah, I mean, they were in a competition. They both had pretty high circulations. Um, Palmer always claimed that his magazine was doing better. <laughs> <laughs> But also, I, I, one of the one of his assistants said that whenever they went to New York, Palmer was very differential to Campbell. He'd sort of sit there as if he's sitting at the feet of his, you know, I don't know, his king or something. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but like supposedly Campbell would sit there puffing on his um, cigarette, you know, with a cigarette holder and, and blowing smoke towards Palmer. Um, but I think they did have a friendship of sorts. Huh. Well, you mentioned that Asimov kind of got to start writing letters to Palmer, and one letter. I saw you mention he was complaining that Palmer had too many kind of anti-communist kind of stories in his magazine. Right. And it does seem like maybe this is an early indication of Palmer's, would you call it his paranoid streak? Um, I wouldn't call it his paranoid streak. Uh, I mean, uh, that was the 1930s, uh, when a lot of people were pretty alarmed by, by Stalinist or Russia or whatever. But um, I, he was definitely a... Um, very all-American patriotic kind of guy who who kind of drifts more and more to right-wing politics. At the time, though, I think he was just kind of succumbing to the kind of jingoism of the time. And Asimov was, was I think, aligned more with a group of more socially progressive writers. The, they called themselves the Futurians. And they even uh, had, you know, some uh, some of the members were pushing it even towards more of a communist, you know, pro-communist <laughs> agenda, which frightened a lot of people. You know, it was a complicated time, but there there was all sorts of these infighting about, you know, how progressive do we want to be? You know, uh, uh, what kind of you know? Because they were making some of them were making the uh, this guy Michel. I think the Michelists were very much almost sounding like they were part of the uh, uh, the socialist uh, wing, uh, definitely of science fiction in America. Well, it's interesting because there's a part in the book where the Futurians show up at a convention and kind of get uh, denied admittance by some other fan, the fan group that had organized the convention. Yeah. And that was actually the first 
World Science Fiction Convention. It was in 1939, and it went in tandem with the World's Fair in, in Queens. Uh, they were, in fact, they were they were invited to um, meet on the World Fair grounds, but they decided they didn't want to pay the admission every day <laughs> to go in. Uh, but yeah, that the uh, there was a, this sort of um, standoff where they didn't let the Futurians in. Uh, they just like you know we don't want you <laughs> joining us in this convention. So it became a huge. Uh, I think by the you know by the fifties, most of the Futurians were editors themselves, people like Frederick Pohl. So it was a interesting uh, period, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so I mean, Palmer, I think, is best known today for publishing these Schaefer mystery stories. So tell us about how did he first encounter this guy, Richard Shaver? Yeah, well, Palmer, you know, was a trickster. Uh, he always loaded his magazine with, you know, like uh, making up pet names for authors that didn't exist and then running whole biographies of them. So he's always looking for ways to kind of prank his readers. And sometimes he let them in on the joke, sometimes he wouldn't. Supposedly, um, you know, they get a lot of crank letters as well. And one day when there's kind of this lull in the action, uh, his assistant, uh, Howard Brown, was uh, looking at some of these crank letters and reading them out for laughs, and he threw one in the garbage, and Palmer just said, you call yourself an editor? Let's publish that, you know? And it was this strange letter from Richard Shaver declaring that he had discovered a new alphabet that came from outer space that, you know, was the universal language of interstellar beings, and it was called Mantong, M-A-N-T-O-N-G, which kind of shows where Shaver's... Uh, thinking was because it was sort of a phonetic version of English where every syllable somehow or other had a sort of a uh, talismanic meaning for uh, the one that comes to my mind is uh, the word ape stood for animals with power and energy you know so in some ways he used all these kind of cosmic terms that could fit anything almost you know it was power or energy every letter had this kind of thing um, and so anyway he, he is a kind of lark uh Palmer printed the letter, and he got a lot of reactions. People were like, "Wow, this is really cool!" You know, or, this is ridiculous. So he, so he just loves stimulating the kind of controversies, and and to bug his you know assistant who had thrown it, Howard Brown who had thrown <laughs> it out. Uh, and then he's like, you know, I really like this guy Shaver, and and he contacted him some more and discovered the guy had some manuscripts tucked away, and um, Shaver had been lo locked up in a in a home for the criminally insane for like ten years. He had been a hobo. And, you know, he's, he was an incredibly creative guy, as it turned out, both an artist and a, um, he, had, he had some art training uh, in Detroit at one of the art academies there. Uh, so he be, he's actually pretty well known today as an outsider artist type, but very hallucinogenic paintings. But anyway, he, he, was, he sent a story to Palmer about this underground civilization, which he called the Daros, D-E-R-O, which was short, I should say, for Detrimental, detrimental Robots. And uh, the Darrows were not mechanical robots. For Sha you know, Shaver had this elaborate worldview. Uh, the, a robot was a person or being that just worked automatically. You know, they, they were kind of locked into a pattern of behavior. So he saw these Darrows as, as these hideous, you know, they're basically devils. They were, he claimed they were torturing, you know, kidnapping earth women and torturing them in very sadistic sexual manners. Uh, I, I could go into details. Uh, he had this whole theory that they had these ray, rays that were would stimulate you sexually or you know or, or warp your mind. I think he called them mind needling, where you, kind of your syntax would get turned into something like from Finnegan's Wake, you know, James Joyce kind <laughs> of sound. Uh, so yeah, I mean, he was this brilliant, creative, and, and somewhat nuts character. And, and Palmer's like, you know, I think I could work with you. And and, and he so he, he printed this first story. I remember Lemuria. He kept trying to build it up for about a year because he kept he was like. Science fiction needs something new, you know, and every year there seemed to be a crisis in science fiction back then, where what's the new science fiction going to be? And he said, I think I found it now, because I'm going to present to you a, a story that's true, you know. <laughs> so he, he, he presented, I remember, Lure Maria as an actual, um, like a, not quite a journalistic piece, but uh, like as, as if the writer Shaver re really had witnessed these uh, Daros and... Uh, so, so he played it up as a case of racial memory, and and this is a true story, you know. So, this really uh, bugs some. You can imagine some of the old Gernsbachian type readers, or the, or the readers of of John Campbell's magazines, that he is running these kind of crazy, um, fun pulp stories, but calling them, you know, absolutely true. So that began the whole Shaver controversy, or the Shaver hoax, some people called it. 
But what Palmer called it the shaver mystery, you know, he, he was always into finding the new mystery. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it wasn't like he was just taking Shaver's material and just publishing it. I mean, he was rewriting these fairly heavily, right? Well, he he, he was um, the early first story for sure. He did a, quite a bit of rewriting. I mean, I, I was able to see some of the letters they wrote to each other where it was very clear that Shaver was thrilled that Palmer was helping him reshape the storylines and the characters and the dialogue. I, I think that, though, that by the end, I mean, he, he published at least 20 of these stories in the, over the next five years, and they became the cover story from 1945 through 49, just about. Uh, I don't have all the titles, but, the, you know, they have titles like Slaves of the Worm was one that strikes me. Uh, and, you know, and, and it was getting readers either more upset, but it was also uh, appealing to a whole new audience, and, and that was... Um, this idea that there's all these, you know, occultists and 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 uh, mystics sort of uh, in America that that needed some outlet, and so all of a sudden, instead of science fiction fans, he was getting these, um, what today we maybe we call new age people writing and saying, you know, Shaver's right, I've been to the caverns too, you know, and it's, and, uh, and people like the the Temple of the White Brotherhood, if I forgot that right, um, all these uh, occult. Uh, organizations were finally, you know, that they could work with science fiction and they, and they were starting to, to uh, have similar stories about how they went under Mount Shasta and met this group of, uh, I sh you know, the Lemurians are actually, I should say, went back to um, Blavatsky's um, Theosophy movement. She had, had posited that both the Atlantis and this other, I think, Pacific uh, island had disappeared called Lemuria with this underground civilization of advanced beings and so on. So it, it, he he... Shaver and, and Palmer were, were, were um, combining these two strands. I mean, it, obviously people like Lovecraft had combined these kind of cultist notions before, but not not claiming them to be true. You know, he, he was doing it as fantasy. <laughs> so I think there was a distinction there. Well, and Shaver actually believed that Lovecraft stories were true, though. Yeah, he would always say, well, of course, Lovecraft and Abraham Merritt and these other fantasy writers had been to the underground realms as well. You know, it's, it was obvious to him, you know. So, yeah. Well, and you said that he was in this hospital, um, and it's pretty striking, the description. I mean, it sounds like he was catatonic. They had to feed him for eight years or so, and that he was just kind of uh, hallucinating that he was imprisoned underground, having all these crazy adventures when he was just lying in this mental hospital for years years on end. Yeah, that's that's what I gather. He had been working on an assembly line in Detroit, and he began to think, he was using a welding gun, I guess you call it. and he, he said he was starting to pick up brainwaves through his welding gun of what people were really thinking or how these hostile people were um, voices he could hear other, that were plaguing other people. And, and it really began, uh, so it's it sort of a psychotic break that had occurred after his brother had died suddenly. His older brother, who had kind of helped him and been a bit of a mentor to him, suddenly died, of, I think, of a heart attack or failure at a, at a young age. And Shaver, yeah, lost it. And... Uh, was eventually hospitalized, uh, and his wife kind of kept his daughter away from him. Uh, so Shaver was uh, pretty upset, and uh, he drifted around a bit, and was at least arrested once in Canada. He had, he had been um, stowing away, I think, on a barge or something like that. So yeah, he, he really knocked about, um, but for Palmer, this was like... Uh, you know, Palmer's mind was always to present things and then try different angles. So he say, you know, this... I really believe that Shaver was in this other realm when he was, you know, trapped in this mental hospital. So that makes it even more likely that this story is true. You know, he'd always find a way to, to, to circle back and prove his point. Right. And so you mentioned that the, the Shaver mystery, it did really boost the sales for amazing stories. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I don't, uh, the figures are, are from Palmer, but uh, um, supposedly it jumped up to about 180,000 copies a month, which was quite was the most successful science fiction magazine at that in that period um and so the you know the uh, publishers were going along with it you know uh, even though there's all this fan controversy in the queen science fiction club or whatever about how we had to stop we had to stop the shaver mystery uh we had to kill it you know um Palmer kept running the stories, and, and he just loved the controversy. That, and the letters pages just became full of these letters on both sides, and a lot of occultists, and uh, Palmer writing faking letters himself, and playing them off each other. So, I mean, for him, you know, it's the notion of any publicity is good publicity. 
Uh, what do you, I mean, in the book, there's this anecdote that Harlan Ellison says that Ray Palmer told him that he was doing it just for publicity and to boost circulation. What do you make of that? Um, I think he probably told him that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I think Palm, Palmer was a trickster. I mean, uh, he definitely was kind of a P.T. Barnum. Uh, but he had the curious, and maybe it's a problem of, of science fiction editors that they that they're so busy trying to imagine alternate realities that they can get sucked into them themselves. So I, Palmer later told someone, "Yes, I did tell Ellison that, but that doesn't mean Shaver stories weren't true." <laughs> uh, you know, I, I presented them this way, and, I, and then I slowly realized that he they were true. And, and some, you know, he, he so he he kind of became a, a mystic, if you will. Uh, I see Shaver as kind of his white rabbit that he's following down into this rabbit hole and, and, and wondering, uh, and also kind of making a, a split from science fiction of the, of the, I don't know, the hard science school, if you will. I think there was a, a kind of a crisis at that point, once again, where uh, Palmer was championing this kind of what, what some people have called sci-fi, P-S-I-Fi. And this had appeared even in Campbell's stories, this notion of the psi powers. Uh, I think the whole, um, um, the slam stories, uh, uh, where the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the author. Um, Van Vogt. Van Vogt, Van Vogt. Yeah, his, his story about slam had, had created a big sensation of the Superman with these, you know, um, telepathic tentacles. And so, I mean, everyone loved that kind of stuff as a storytelling detail, but um, Palmer was taking it into you know, maybe this stuff has some some reality to it that we're just we're too silly or too afraid to to investigate. Right. Well, and I love this uh, this fan letter you quote from James Kepner. He says, "We followers of science fiction are interested in literate attempts to preconstruct the future." The editor of this magazine has renounced his faith. So again, putting it in these kind of religious terms. Yeah, yeah, uh, Kepner. Uh... Yeah, he actually printed a whole thing, R.I.P. Amazing Stories, I think, in that issue of his fanzine. And this, this, this is when the controversy finally was. You know, World War II had just ended, and I think people, were, the fans, uh, were getting over all these atrocities during the war, and they were, and then they were looking at, they were finally looking at the Shaver controversy, and that was Kepner's response was to kind of do an in memoriam, you know, Amazing Stories issue. Uh, but for uh, for Palmer, he was saying, you know, I'm taking science fiction in a new direction, and um, I think in some ways uh, subsequent history bears him out because uh, Palmer's kind of was had this ironic edge to his uh, notion of conspiracy theories or the mystical realms that kind of play into current, fairly current entertainment mode, what, what I would call the Machu conspiracy drama, the kind of X-Files uh, approach to the paranormal. So I think he was t- tackling the paranormal at a time when it was very stigmatized. You know, Eisenhower, America, uh, spiritualism had been a big deal back in the 19th century, but nobody in the 50s, you know, would be considered in their right mind to be reporting that they were channeling, you know, spirits or whatever. So Palmer's like, you know, this customary gusto and, and kind of guts was like, you know, not not ashamed to defend these people and kind of give them a voice and a place to uh, to voice their views. But unfortunately, that was amazing stories. It was didn't seem to be the place for it for the you know the fans, right? Well, and you mentioned this sort of sci-fi movement, PSI mm-hmm. uh, dash SCI, and you mentioned that John W. Campbell kind of got into this as well. Um, talk about that because he this is is this around the same time he's kind of starts publishing the L. Ron Hubbard Dianetics pieces. Yeah, this so this would be the um, I, I think for Campbell it was the late the early fifties. For uh, Palmer, it might have been a couple of years earlier, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, Campbell definitely had some crankish aspects that were starting to show up more clearly in the 50s. Uh, I think he also was promoting some, um, what was it, the Hieronymus machine, <laughs> a kind of free energy machine, you know, so I think he was going a little wacky too, you know, maybe they, they both, had, it reminds me of Don Quixote, you know, the, the guy who reads so many tales of chivalry that he, you know, he can't distinguish his everyday reality from from a landscape of dragons and, and monsters. Um, so, yeah, I think that Campbell was exhibiting some similar symptoms, if you will. I mean, how would you compare Dianetics to the Schaefer mystery? Do you see them as fairly similar, or do you see them as different in any way? Well, I, I, I you know, I, that's, wow, that's almost beyond my expertise, but 
Dianetics, I think, as it was was supposed to be a psychological theory, you know, um, with all this notion, some, with some some overlap with Freudian psych, psychoanalysis, ideas of memories affecting your behavior and trying to clear you of it. So, I mean, it had a sort of psychoanalytic therapeutic model. Shaver, I mean, <laughs> Shaver had as, as elaborate a worldview, and I, th- I don't know all of the, um, the, the Scientology worldview. I mean, Shaver, so Shaver thought there's a therapeutic value in, in warning people that they're being controlled by, by the Darrow and how they had to free themselves of, the, of this interplay of this disintegrant, you know, forces in the universe. Uh, and, and in some ways it was playing out his own, you know, mental health issues probably at, at large in the world. Um, for Shaver, I mean, he, he had a small following uh, of, of they, they had a Shaver mystery club and their own fan letter and um, uh, were encouraging him to write a longer work on, on on the topic but of course it never became this huge world movement uh, as did uh, Scientology right well you say that uh that Schaefer didn't have the sales skills or ruthlessness required to turn his stories into a religion the way that L. Ron Hubbard did well yeah I mean he just wasn't a single-minded you know directed character he, he was easily distracted uh you know later in in the 50s when Palmer kind of dropped the Shaver mystery and moved on to starting fate magazine which was a he kind of took the pulp aesthetic into uh, creating a a a a magazine for people who are interested in the in the paranormal and and, in modern mysteries uh unexplained mysteries including ufos he really got into that movement in late 40s and helped instigate it but um yeah so shaver um in the late 50s when palmer was moving on to other things uh, such as flying saucers shaver they they both had neighboring farms in Wisconsin at this point. You know, they were great friends. Shaver was marching through the potato fields. I guess the farmers would, you know, take the, the stones and, and move them to the sides of the fields, and Shaver would be cracking them open and seeing images in them. You know, they were influencing his artworks. He's painting these great uh, canvases, like the Attack of the Apats. And he was convinced he was seeing all these scenes in the rocks. You know, the, the rocks had information for him. Um, so, you know, he, he was... Um, he was not a guy to, to start a, his own religion. He was too busy. <laughs> he was too fascinated by the details, if you, you could say. Right. But this is one thing that seems to argue against Palmer just being a straight out hoaxer because he did become good friends with Shaver. And like you say, they bought farms adjacent to each other and so on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, again, I, I, I think that Palmer thought there, they, they, he printed a whole series of magazines called The Hidden World in, in the 50s and early 60s. Uh, which is pretty much dedicated to the Shaver mystery and his correspondence with Shaver. So I, I think, yeah, I think he became um, something of a mystic. I mean, I, I, but all his all his beliefs were kind of, I think, had this this double edged. Uh, uh, you know, am I trying to sell you something, or am I trying to sell myself something? You know, he he would. Uh, he would always say, you know, it's, it's up to you to decide if this stuff's true, folks. The, when he, he lost control of Fate magazine, and when his partners decided, you know, um, we, don't, we don't have to believe it, but it has to be believable, was, was, <laughs> was their motto when they, when they took it over. Because they felt like Palmer was just going to over the deep end with printing stories about, you know, Venusians walking the earth, uh, which was provoking letters uh, from readers are saying, well, actually, Venusians are 15 feet tall and purple and hermaphrodites and nudists, so I don't think they're walking the earth. You know, so it's just like the dialogues that just, <laughs> these are not, this is not the, the makings of a mass circulation digest, for, you know, for Fate magazine, which actually had a, I think it was, it, 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 its um, circulation climbed up over 100,000 uh, after Palmer left to about 120,000. It did very well in the 50s because it really was a niche market. It was a place for people, you know, with um, psychic experiences or whatnot, to to uh, to find like-minded individuals and and not feel um, stigmatized or like, you know, branded as kooks or whatever. Right. Well, what do you make of this experience that Palmer had? He he stays at Shaver's house at one point and overhears <laughs> a conversation between all these different voices from the next room. Yeah, I mean, again, in one way, is that just Palmer telling a story uh, of why he be can't began to believe in the shaver possibility of the shaver mystery being true i have no idea um i don't know if he made it up i don't think he did because he talked about it later in letters to shaver when he said you know i, I really i heard these voices uh, i didn't know if you were 
if they were you, I didn't know if you had hidden microphones in the room. I wanted to believe it, but I wanted to investigate it. You know, he, he was never sure about it. So I think the fact that he was follow, you know, writing these letters later indicates that he actually had had this experience and it had kind of thrown him for a loop. Uh, it almost, but he wrote it almost like a, you know, a ghost story of him visiting this, you know, this remote farmhouse and being like the, you know, the naive visitor with this kind of eerie goings on. <laughs> So, you know, he always knew how to spin a tail. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, as as such a hardcore science fiction fan who who reads this stuff all day long, I kind of like to think that of it being really salubrious and having this prophylactic effect against, uh, you know, nonsense that you, you, you're like, oh, I've heard that idea before in a story. I'm not that impressed by it. So it just kind of pains me that two of the biggest editors of the pulp era, um, you know, sort of went off the deep end in this way. Um, you, you said maybe, I don't know, because I mean, you say maybe they read too much stuff, kind of like Don Quixote, but I've, I've read all this stuff and I don't buy it at all. <laughs> well, I, not yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, stay, there's a... stay tuned for future episodes of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. But... Well, there is a, uh, there's a religious studies professor, uh, Jeffrey Cripple, who's, is, who wrote a whole uh, book you might be interested in. I'm sure you wouldn't agree with it, but it's called uh, Mutants and Mystics. And he's kind of arguing that... Uh, it's got the subtitle is science fiction, superhero comics, and the paranormal. And he argues that at least that a lot of people that were involved on, on a kind of creative level with engaging with paranormal ideas as for storytelling reasons later had these full blown mystic experiences. And he, he, he uses Palmer as one of the examples and um, some more current uh, graphic novel artists. But again, yeah, I think there's a, there's a, uh, there's a clear split in the science fiction community between the um, kind of Gernsbachian notion of, you know, the whole point is to create a better future, you know, and um, and, and maybe what what had been the more the high fantasy realm, uh, you know, of magic and, and, and occult knowledge, it, finding its outlet again, you know, through people like Palmer and, and the current day conspiracy theory and, and what I'm calling mock you conspiracy. Right. I, I heard one analysis one time of Campbell that, that maybe the reason that he got into it was it was not so much because of uh, not so much of an inability to recognize silliness, but more out of a um, desire to be important in the world that, hmm. you know, you get to a point where you want to be more than just a magazine editor. You want to be someone who's discovered something that's going to change the world. And it becomes very attractive then to kind of latch onto anything you might that might give you that sense of uh, importance. Yeah, well, I think that that, that would fit with, uh, you know, um, the analysis of delusional thinking or, or, or um, uh, conspiracy thinking or, you know, even cults, the idea that it's explaining the world. It's, 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 so it's a guide to the perplexed in a sense. Um, and I, you know, I think Palmer, he, he was like half a victim and, and, and trapped in these notions. And, but also, I think he saw a, a positive side to them. I mean, because it, it's sort of... Um, you know, it's akin to religious experience, whatever. Um, so he, he didn't want to put people down. He, he felt like he had a very open mind and he wanted to open other people's minds. And to do that, he would always sh shock them with these kind of crazy ideas. Like there was a you know, hole at the pole of the, of the, <laughs> the, the earth, where you could go into the inner earth. And he would insist on it. You know, he'd show, show a picture from NASA of the earth with this black hole at the pole. And writers, would, you know, readers would say, hey, you know, that's that's silly. And he like, I didn't say it was true. I just wanted to make you think about it, you know, and I'd love to know that the answer, it doesn't have to be a whole, you know, so, I, in a way for Palmer, I mean, and he, you know, he was working with a, a diminishing um, readership and, and in some, some ways he was always just trying to throw out controversy that would, you know, get some attention and, and in that sense, some importance, but he also, yeah, unfortunately, uh, descended more and more into kind of a, what I would call right wing, uh, Conspiracy theories, uh, even with a tinge of a uh, anti-Semitism uh, towards the end of his life, kind of like the John Birch notion that there, there's a one world, or you know, the, the, this this secret government was preparing to take over the, the world, and occasionally he, his, his writings would would delve into this sort of thing. So, in, in some sense, I see him uh, oscillating between this notion of free free openness of thought and dialogue and engagement. And on the other hand, this kind of attractiveness and seductiveness of these preset, you know, um, world systems that explained everything, and where there's no longer, kind of like a shaver, there's no longer any mystery. It, it's it's like anthropologists talking about witchcraft. There's 
there's always a reason for everything, you know, it's, it's switches, you know? Um, so there's never, a, there's never a, a chance event. And I think that's sort of seductive possibly for people. Well, right. And you talk in the book about how much of kind of modern day UFO conspiracy theories and the whole reptoid secretly rule the world kind of thing comes out of science fiction and Palmer actually specifically. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the Shaver mystery really, highlighted that notion of the underground realm for, for a more modern audience. And, you know, the, some of these occult groups latched onto it and started embellishing it with their own tales of initiations underground uh, with these strange beings like Lemurians or the Atlantans. And slowly this becomes more and more toxic over the years with the idea of a kind of reptoid underground civilization, which I really, you know, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs had, had created a, a race like that for one of his earlier novels. Uh, so it's kind of this mixing of pulp fiction with metaphysics, if you will. And it slowly becomes like, then someone comes up with a note. And, and I think, you know, you can see it, this kind of working out in the internet in age, age where more and more people are kind of concocting a theory. Uh, Palmer had, had helped do this whole round robin novel back in the 30s uh, where we had different authors write different chapters. And you started to see these conspiracy theories as the similar kind of idea of a round robin novel where everyone's taking it further and 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 one one conspiracy theorist notes that you know no matter the origin of a conspiracy theory it tends to drift towards the preset conspiracies which tend to be you know anti-semitism or things like that and so so someone eventually says all oh, the reptile tile <laughs> reptilians are somehow you know uh adam had two sons and, and one <laughs> i mean sorry eve had, had two sons and, and one of them was with this, was with the serpent, and these were the reptilian, and and these are the Semitic races, you know, so just crazy stuff. <laughs> and so, so I, I mean, if you want to say that, I think Palmer had by by circulating these myths, if you will, in the in the fifties, was giving other people fodder to kind of keep latching more and more nutty ideas onto. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I mean, one thing that that really struck me in the book is this idea that there are in sort of 1950, there are nobody claiming to be abducted by aliens. And then the day the Earth stood still comes out in 1951. And suddenly people are just coming out of the woodwork saying that they were abducted by aliens. Yeah, uh, there were a lot of um, sightings, you know, in the late 40s. And again, this was, uh, I think 1947 is the key year when uh, the Kenneth Arnold, the pilot in, in the Pacific Northwest, says he's happened to see a bunch of flying saucers skipping around the mountaintops of Mount Rainier. Uh, he didn't actually describe them as saucers at the time. But this just triggered a, a, a worldwide uh, wave of sightings, you know, all sorts of people, scientists, other pilots, airline pilots, military personnel. were seeing these UFOs all over the world. You know, it was just this amazing phenomena. Uh, you know, Carl Jung wrote about it and, and said, I don't know, you know, if these are real, but it seems like a significant symptom of the times, you know, that why, why, and he was, he kind of analyzed a lot of his patients' dreams where they were seeing these flying saucers or, or their artwork. And he was trying to, you know, he, he thought it had something to do with the Cold War and, and this kind of sense of a splintered world into all these different spheres of influence. And it was kind of like the planet was schizophrenic in some ways. And, and then the, and the, and the UFO was in some way going to heal it, you know, this kind of, for Jung, it was idea of a, a, like a mandala, a unity, a, a, a symbol of wholeness. And and so that was the first wave. And then, uh, as you say, in the early 50s, um, after the day the Earth stood still, uh, that template of the kind of um, really the uh, Messiah theme, uh, the, uh, Klaatu, I think it's Klaatu. Is that Klaatu the robot? Yeah, Klaatu. <laughs> Klaatu is... Well, is, well, is uh, Kla Klaatu is the, ro uh, the alien and Gord is the robot. Right, yeah. So Klaatu is, becomes a uh, kind of Jesus figure, uh, the visitor from outer space warning Earth that they have to, you know, change their ways. And this became the, uh, or, or or else, you know, I should add. And that, or the or else, I guess, was Gord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Robot. But, uh, so, yeah, this became just a, a really popular myth, uh, or if you will, um, template for other people to claim that they had actually met somebody like Klaatu. And this became this whole contactee subculture. There are all these flying saucer clubs in America. At least 150 of them were contactee clubs. Uh, there was even a space age candidate, uh, I think for the presidency in the early 60s, who claimed he had been contacted by UFOs. Uh, so 
uh, you can see popular culture really influencing, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, <laughs> the national psyche or the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so, yeah, and so obviously Palmer bears a lot of the responsibility for this way in which science fiction readers came to be associated with UFO conspiracy nuts in the uh, popular imagination, which led people, like we mentioned earlier, to say that Palmer was the man who killed science fiction. What do you think about that? that label of the man who killed science fiction. How, how fair is that? Well, you know, I, I think of the cliche, you know, you always kill the thing you love. And, uh, and in that sense, I think Palmer, you know, loved science fiction. It was kind of his lifesaver as he, as a teenager. And so I think there's any, he, when he describes how, when he became editor of amazing stories, he was practically cackling like a mad scientist. Finally, I have it in my power to sh reshape this magazine, you know, into the vision I have. Um, I really think though that he, I don't know. <laughs> I, I want to say that I, I see a positive side of his embracing of, of the uh, crackpot culture and that he was, well, as with Shaver, he was in some ways in a therapeutic process with Shaver, helping him, you know, not just be a lonely guy sitting alone with his delusions. He was letting him become a creative artist, uh, and shaping stories that people weren't enjoying. And I, th and I think in his magazines like Fate, he was giving people who felt, you know, isolated because of their psychic experiences uh, a, a, a sort of safe place, if you will, a haven. So I see it in, in some ways as, as a positive therapeutic approach. On the other hand, his, his showmanship and his, you know, kind of Carnival Barker side uh, led him to not, you know, he, he saw himself as guided by this notion of liberty and individualism and, and freedom of speech and thought. But you also see how he was happy to, to play up these kind of toxic ideas, maybe. Well, but he was uh, ahead of his time in some good ways as well, right? I mean, he actually, you say he actually published the first story, Sympathetic to Homosexuality, uh, in 1953 by Theodore Sturgeon. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, he, that was his sort of daring and bold side. He loved to take up a dare and, and, and to, to go to bad for people. And so Sturgeon's story just was not being picked up, uh, I think. Um, the legend has it that um, uh, Campbell said, you know, don't I, it's, I don't want anyone to touch this story. You know, he's talking to other editors. And so that immediately meant that Palmer was going to touch it, you know. And uh, Palmer had his own, um, he had left Amazing Stories. He started Fate Magazine and he had his own, briefly, he had his own science fiction magazine. Uh, then uh, it has various names. Uh, uh, other Worlds was the one that he put that um, story in there by Sturgeon. And, you know, he also did another story at that time that was really, I think, reflected his concerns about handicapped people. Uh, um, I'd have to look it up, but he talks about a, a Martian who comes to Earth trying to help these um, kids in a post-nuclear holocaust time uh, and adapt to a radioactive environment. And they thought he was a monster. And so it was kind of this whole idea of, you know, you got to look past people's appearances and, and recognize that they're not necessarily monsters. So I think that kind of was his own idea of, of seeing himself as he would joke about how I, how I could star in a horror movie, you know, the way he looked. He also ran all these um, crusades. He, he thought of himself as a crusader. He helped raise a lot of money for the Navajo Indians in the late 40s. They, apparently, they had huge short, food shortages back then. And he, he had a big crusade against nuclear fallout in, in the um, early 50s, which led him to be investigated by the FBI as, as a possible communist because he was saying, you know, the government's lying to you about the dangers of fallout. And, and indeed, the, the government was, you know, circulating pamphlets saying, you know, to people in Nevada saying, you know, you really don't have to worry about the, these tests. The, the, they're not going to harm you in any way. So he, he actually, he also uh, warned people about pesticides uh, before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. I mean, so he actually did, again, his, his, his desire to take up new ideas and, and to challenge authority uh, were pretty strong. And so he's a strong-minded character who did do a lot of good um, as well as a lot of bad, I'd say. <laughs> you actually say in the book that a lot of gay rights activists came out of early science fiction fandom. I was just curious if there was more you could say about that. Um, I, do, I don't have too much information, but I just happened to notice uh, just by, uh, for example, Kepner, who had killed, who, who claimed that uh, Amazing Stories had died, you know, he ended up being a, a big gay rights advocate and uh, a few other people whose um, names I'm not hitting on right now uh, became very vocal proponents in the 
60s and 70s. I, I think that you can see that science fiction as a community, while, while it was not particularly tolerant, uh, you know, uh, openly, I mean, it did provide a refuge for people where they could imagine better futures like Kepner. That, that's what he said about why he didn't like Palmer anymore is that he, he saw science fiction as a way to construct more positive futures and, and Palmer was instead, uh, you know, getting into this occult nonsense. So for him, uh, I think that you could see how that could lead into his, his advocacy of gay rights later. Right, right. Well, so, so now that the, the book's been out for a while, what uh, kind of reactions have you been getting to the book? Um, let's see. <laughs> well, you know, I, I get, I've, I've got, pretty positive reactions from um from people who who are fans of of the old pulps or science fiction history i'm not getting as much reaction as i thought from you know current science fiction writers i think it, i think it takes a certain kind of science fiction writer to, the, to get interested in, in in the history of the medium so right well, will you actually say that it seems like there's been almost an active effort among <laughs> historians of the genre to downplay Palmer's uh, impact because they're kind of just embarrassed about him. Yeah, well, I think that was especially true in the in, in the fifties. I mean, by the time that he was given the plaque saying you're the son of science fiction, he was kind of being forgiven. And because you know, the science fiction at, at the pulp market had just crumbled about that time too. So people were realizing that you had to do whatever you could to survive at that point. And a lot a lot of people, for example, in Chicago. Uh, Ziff Davis was moving from Chicago to New York, taking all his magazines with. And so there are a lot of marooned, if you will, uh, science fiction writers and editors uh, in Chicago. And, and uh, people like Hugh Hefner and um, William Hamling started those first girly magazines, Playboy and, and Rogue, and, and hired a lot of these people um, to write a lot of sort of uh, softcore porn novels. Um, so I think that the fact that Palmer was catering to the UFO crowd was a pardonable sin in their mm-hmm. minds. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think, I think there was a, an active uh, distaste for him in, in accounts maybe through the 50s and early 60s. Uh, but I, I think if he's either forgotten today or remembered with some, I know most of the uh, people I've talked to or um, read, you know, on postings and blogs or fanzines or whatever, you know, they, there's a sort of affection for him because he was this very kind of sweet, lovable guy in his, in, in his feisty way. Yeah. Do you ever hear from people who were disciples of Shaver or maybe still are who, are there people around who still believe in that kind of stuff? Um, I'm sure there are. There's a, a magazine, I think it's now uh, online called the Shaver Tron uh, Journal, I think it's called. So, uh, and I, I think it has a little bit of tongue in cheek quality, but again, it's a way to rally around and treat these things with some irony, but also with some open-mindedness, you know, where it's sort of a forum for possibly crank thought, but also, you know, we're just kind of having fun with this. Uh, you kind of see that ironic sensibility maybe at play. Uh, there might be a f- also, you know, Shaver is a very collectible artist now. So if, if you happen to run into any of his canvases, uh, they're, they're picking up in value. He's had a couple major shows. I know he, he died in 72, I think it is, but um, his canvases have some value now. It's interesting. I, I was just really curious reading this book. It just shows this tremendous knowledge of science fiction and of fan culture. I was just wondering, have you been involved? Like, what's your background with science fiction and fandom? Um, I really, I'm, I'm something of an outsider, really. I, 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 I guess I call myself a scholar of, of, of popular science, and, and, and particularly uh, as it ends up, um, how popular science can. Be, can kind of uh, modulate into uh, religious notions or mystic notions. Uh, my first book was called Wonder Shows, looking at how uh, showmen in the 19th and early 20th century kind of played with the categories of science in, in the popular realm, either, you know, with the kind of Tesla machines uh, shooting sparks from their, there was a Christian evangelist who you know, used that kind of apparatus to, to, to preach. Uh, so I was looking at characters like that, and I thought, well, obviously uh, science fiction is part of the theme here, but I just knew it was a separate book. <laughs> uh, it would be too much to tackle, so I, I left it as a, as a separate uh, enterprise. But I, I guess I feel like science fiction has become such an important genre that I wanted to look at how it really originated. And, I, and doing the research for that first book, I had read a lot of Gern's books, um, uh, Science Invention magazine and um, uh, his other early magazines, Radio News, just looking at, again, how popular science kind of had the took on this um, 
emotions of a and fervor of almost a religious like uh, zeal there and and this mythic di- dimensions if you could say um so so i got interested in gernsbach doing that research and as it happens the the cover i use on that novel turned out to be from fate magazine it's of a hypnotist um <laughs> uh hypnotizing this young woman uh in a low cut gown and you know very silly 50s kind of schla- um pulp kind of cover and, and I happened to start reading up about Fate Magazine and so, and so I thought that Balmer was an interesting character. He'd been neglected, he'd been kind of reviled and yet his life spanned all these different movements and and uh, history so I thought it might be a good uh, book topic. Yeah, I mean I did see on your Facebook page you said you were going to attend a science fiction convention and talk about your book. You said maybe I'll meet my longtime hero Gene Wolfe. Did you ever <laughs> yeah. uh, end up meeting Gene Wolfe? I didn't meet Gene Wolfe. Uh, I, I, yeah, because I, I think, uh, you know, I entered science fiction sort of in the punk rock era when everybody was reading uh, J.G. Ballard and and, and, and uh, uh, William Burroughs. And, and uh, so, you know, I kind of took the back door, the revolving door into science fiction, <laughs> maybe in the 80s. So Gene Wolfe became one of my you know, favorite authors back then. No, I haven't met him yet, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, certainly he stands out in my mind as the science fiction author who's used religious themes maybe to the greatest effect in his work. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 also, I just love his t- the texture of the worlds he creates, and, and the uh, he does a great job of, of just conjuring up an alien environment that seems hard to imagine how somebody got there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I love about it. Uh, okay, great. And so I guess just finally, I would just want to mention, I think that this is, I really liked this line where you say, uh, at his best, Palmer kept asking what if. At his best, he knew that people who knew were full of baloney. That included those who clung to religious or scientific orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, I, I do. I, I see him as a very, you know, rebellious character. And again, this was his notion of being a proud American, a free-thinking guy, and and so being opposed to any kind of orthodoxy. So he took all these, you know, contradictory positions. He he. he he admired, for example, the Age of Aquarius song and, and the whole musical hair. So he's sort of into the flower children. But he also told him, you know, LSD is a really bad idea. You're, you, there may be another dimension you can enter that way, but he saw it as kind of like a death wish or something to be dabbling in drugs. So he had all these – you couldn't predict what, what his position on anything would be. <laughs> you know, he, just, he had a very singular – and he said people consult everything. They consult oracles. They consult uh, – tarot cards but they don't consult themselves you know so he 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 kind of believed that you had to find the answers within in some way so he he was against um he oh he also he was really against the jesus movement in the 60s too so he was just he was a really complex character with a lively (laughs) mind all right great so that's pretty much all our time so i think we're going to wrap things up there so we've been speaking with Fred Natus, and his book again is called The Man from Mars, Ray Palmer's Amazing Pulp Journey. So Fred, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I enjoyed it. Thank you. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Fred Natus for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Peter Byrne, Wallace Simonson, and Kenneth Lean, who all just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, Please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.